This video is really all about Planck's constant and how Planck introduced this mathematical expression here, which is very simple, um, in order to explain the amount of radiation being emitted from the sun or indeed from everyday objects such as this old light bulb. So let's take a look at what is going on here. So first of all, we need to consider the fact that every single object around us is in fact glowing with emission of electromagnetic radiation in accordance with how hot that object is. So looking at the sun here, its surface temperature is at about 6,000 degrees centigrade, and as a result, it has a whole broad spectrum of electromagnetic radiation being emitted. Now, um, to the right there, I've shown um, the Earth. Let's zoom in on the Earth because it has a temperature on average of about 14 degrees centigrade. Now, of course, there are all manner of reasons as to why it's 14 degrees centigrade on average. But what I want to focus on here is the fact that it is an object that has, of course, heat energy and therefore will be emitting electromagnetic radiation just like the sun does. But of course, we don't see it shining brightly like the sun. So let's have a look at, for example, a nighttime location on the Earth, uh, where we might have some scene like this, where it seems we cannot see anything at all. And so how on Earth is the Earth glowing or giving off electromagnetic radiation? Well, if we use special night vision cameras, then we can in fact see into the infrared part of the spectrum and we realize, of course, that the Earth is giving off electromagnetic radiation. Now, if we consider hotter objects like volcanoes on the surface of the Earth, then even at night time, we would be able to see the volcanic lava that's being emitted here because it's about 1000 degrees centigrade. Or if we go to even hotter objects, for example, welding metals together here, we're in excess of 3000 degrees centigrade. And as a result, we see, we're seeing blue white kind of light coming off from that very hot fusion of the metals coming together. So this is the basic trend. We're seeing that with increasing temperature of the object, we get an increase in the peak frequency of the light being emitted. So for example, at lower frequencies, that would be the red end of the spectrum. And then at higher frequencies, that would be the blue end of the spectrum. Now this is captured by something called Vian's displacement law. So the peak frequency of the light emitted from an object relates in a proportional way to the temperature of the object, just like we're showing on this slide. Okay, so what is the mechanism behind that? Well, it's perhaps quite easy to understand, of course, that materials, objects are made up of atoms and molecules which are composed of charged particles. Now we know that, of course, objects have a certain heat energy, they're not at zero degrees Kelvin in general, and therefore the atoms and molecules are moving around. We have charged particles moving around in various ways, and therefore we have emission of electromagnetic radiation. Okay, so this is where we were, surface of the Earth. We can't see it, but it's in the infrared. It's giving off uh, radiation. Volcanoes, we could see. Welding, we could certainly see, but we've got to have protective equipment, of course. And the sun also is giving off um, a broad range of electromagnetic radiation. Now, a very special case to look at now would be the case of a light bulb, which would have a filament maybe around 2,000, 3,000 degrees centigrade. And it was the light bulb, which of course was very much advanced thanks to Thomas Edison. Um, it was the light bulb which was of interest to Max Planck. His job really was to explain the, the range of electromagnetic radiation that we see coming from a light bulb in order to somehow optimize the design of a light bulb for the amount of energy that's put into it. Because the problem was that we weren't able to explain it with classical physics. And so he was looking at this problem of how to describe the electromagnetic spectrum from a so-called black body. And I'll go into that in the next slide. But if we could describe the electromagnetic radiation from a black body accurately, then in turn, we'd also be able to describe the distribution of light coming off from a light bulb and so optimize its design. So what is a black body? Well, a black body is a perfect absorber and emitter of electromagnetic radiation. Now, the reason I've mentioned the sun is because that is approximately a black body. And a black body is one that, for example, just take an object. If it were a black body, and if you were to shine torchlight onto that object, 
it would completely absorb your torchlight and not reflect any back to you whatsoever. So therefore it would look black, it wouldn't reflect back any light. So that is an example of what a black body would do. Now, if we look at the spectrum of emitted radiation from a black body, then this is the amount of uh, radiation uh, given off for a particular frequency of that radiation. So obviously we'd have part of it being in the visible range, part you know, in the radio wave range and so on. Uh, for a certain temperature, we have a particular distribution of the electromagnetic uh, radiation that is given off as a function of the frequency or wavelength of that uh, radiation. Now, as we consider cooler objects, um, so here we're starting 8,000 Kelvin, there we're approximating the sun, uh, we can see that that peak frequency is dropping with reduced temperature, which indeed is what we saw earlier on. And so perhaps, um, though it's going to be easier moving forward now, to consider the amount of electromagnetic radiation given off as a function of wavelength. So we just remember, of course, that wavelength and frequency are inversely related as follows. Therefore, now, as we consider a hot object or colder objects, now this peak is moving towards the right. In other words, cooler objects have a peak of a higher wavelength. And so as we heat objects up, that peak wavelength goes down because the frequency is going up, just like we saw earlier on. Now, the problem was that classical physics wasn't able to describe this distribution of emission of radiation from black bodies. There was the rayleigh genes law, um, devised by Lord Rayleigh and Sir James Jeans. These were English physicists. They came up with this law that seemed to work at this range of wavelengths for explaining the amount of radiation given off from a black body. But as you considered these smaller wavelengths, they were considering, they were basically predicting ever increasing amounts of electromagnetic radiation being given off to the point of it actually looking like it's shooting up to infinity for the case of wavelengths of around zero or near infinite frequency. And so that's why this was referred to as the ultraviolet catastrophe. So this is like the ultraviolet part of the spectrum and the Rayleigh genes law was predicting phenomenally large amounts of radiation at that part of the spectrum, which clearly doesn't correspond to reality. So this is where Max Planck came in with his, what he thought was just a mathematical fix to the problem, but it turns out to be profoundly true of physical reality, which is that light energy comes in the form of quanta. In other words, it comes in little discrete packets. You can't just have an arbitrary amount of energy for a given frequency of light. Rather, for a given frequency of light, it has to come in packets of size delta E, where the packet of energy is of size simply HF. It's just proportional to the frequency. So therefore, the higher the frequency of the light, the more the energy we need to make a unit or a, a quantum unit, if you like, one quantum, one photon of that frequency of light. So it sounds simple, but it has a lot of ramifications. So first of all, then, let's take a look at that very simple linear relationship. Amount of energy needed to make a photon as a function of frequency just goes up in a linear fashion using what we now know as Planck's constant H as the constant of proportionality. What does that mean? Well, imagine we had some energy E, some energy budget, and we wanted to express that in terms of photons. So imagine then we had um, light of low frequency. That would mean we'd only need a small amount of energy to make a photon for that frequency of light, which means that we can actually make a lot of those photons for that energy budget. Or if we increase the frequency, if we consider higher frequency light, then we can make fewer photons for that particular energy budget that I've given by the red E on this graph. If we try and make yet another photon, we exceed the budget and we can't do it. So then we go to even higher frequencies. Now we can only make two photons with that energy budget E. If we try and make another one, if we exceed the budget. Or if we were to consider an even higher frequency of light, then a photon would demand more energy than we actually have. We cannot make any photons of that particular frequency. So we see how this simple relationship has profound consequences. It fixes 
the problem with the Rayleigh genes law. So now we still have this increase um, in amount of radiation given off um, as we decrease the wavelength, but now it can't keep shooting up um, for low wavelengths or very large frequencies because the demand is that we need more and more energy to make a single photon of um, light or of electromagnetic radiation of that particular frequency. And it means we reach a peak and then that, that quantization kicks in and it means that we just cannot produce many photons of this low wavelength to the point that in fact you can't make any photons of extremely small wavelengths because that corresponds to extremely high frequency which has a huge demand for energy to even make a single photon. So that idea of the energy packet size which goes up with increasing frequency that's used in Planck's law here beautifully generates these black body spectra that correspond to physical reality. So we see that, as I mentioned, no photons are produced at that extremely low wavelength or extremely high frequency, and that matches beautifully with the data that are observed for light bulbs or indeed for sunlight. So there is Planck's constant. What a profound consequence that it relates to the quantization, the quantization of light and matter. You can't just have arbitrary amounts of energy um, for, for your light. Um, so that's expressed by this well-known expression. And then also even Planck's constant comes in when we consider de Broglie's relationship between the wavelength of a, of a matter particle and uh, its momentum. And it also comes in in the expression of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, which talks about the degree of precision we can have in measuring a particle's momentum given a particular precision, precision in measurement of its position. And we see Planck's constant appearing yet again there. So I hope that's given you some insight into Planck's constant and how it related in the first instance to solving our understanding of electromagnetic radiation being given off from every object around us. Thanks for listening.